I understand that there is a fine line between a sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> I've got 15 minutes to preach this sermon before worship's supposed to be over. So you bear with me while I try and be kind to you. If you have John chapter 9 open, then you have an outline of our lesson for today. There's a really interesting encounter between Jesus and a man who was born blind whom Jesus will heal. And he will quickly in this narrative become the formerly blind man. As we're going through this account, what we'll notice though is that there is a much larger picture that's being painted. Not merely about spiritual sight, rather physical sight, but about spiritual sight. And so Jesus will begin to heal this man who is born physically blind, and then he will address the spiritual blindness of the Pharisees who will challenge not only the healed man, but also Jesus himself. As we go through this narrative, what I want us though to hit on especially are the statements that are made about the Lord and what they remind us relative to why Jesus came to earth. You know, a lot of folks this time of year are focused on the fact that Jesus came to earth. Interestingly, the angels do rejoice, don't they, at the birth of Christ. And yet, the emphasis of Scripture is not on the fact that He came, but upon why He came. And John chapter 9 certainly demonstrates that to us. As Jesus passed by, verse 1 says, He sees a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They're reflecting a common misunderstanding of the day. All right, if this is this man and he was born in this condition, who sinned to make that condition be the case? Was it this man who sinned at some point? Was it his parents who sinned? Jesus answered and said, it was not that this man sinned or that his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus is going to use this uh, instance to teach the truth about spiritual blindness. Verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Pause right there. Notice that Jesus' emphasis here is not solely on this man and his physical sight, but upon Jesus being presented as the solution to the spiritual blindness of the people that surround him. It is not merely that here's a man who exists in the darkness of not being able to physically see, but that there are people all around who, though they can physically see, are spiritually in darkness. Jesus presents himself as the solution. I am the light of the world. John chapter 9 verse 5. And so verse 6, having said these things, he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva and anointed, that is, he put the mixture on the man's eyes. And he said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. We pause right there in the narrative to make just a few observations. First, I suppose all Jesus would have had to do is to say the word and for this man to be healed. If that. Remember a centurion comes to Jesus and says, Lord, if you will, you can make my servant healed. I suppose all Jesus would have had to do would be to think that he wanted this man to be healed. And it would have been the case. But instead, as a test to this man's faith, and as a means of teaching a vital lesson, Jesus takes his saliva, spits on the ground, makes a mud mixture, puts that on the man's eyes, and commands him to go and wash, to go and wash in a significant pool, the pool of Siloam, which John adds parenthetically means sent. Here's this man who is sent to this pool to wash, and he is sent by this man Jesus who has been sent by the Father on a very specific mission. Why did Jesus come to earth? As we go through this text, I want us to take a few tangents to highlight from Jesus' own lips, purpose statements for his coming. And the first one is, is brought to our memory from that pool of Siloam. Jesus came, he was sent to display the power of God. 
You know, the man comes back seeing. He obeyed, he was healed. And by the way, isn't that a perfect analogy for you and me? We do what Jesus says, and in response, we are cleansed of our sins. Jesus says, believe and is baptized in order to be saved, all right? We believe on him, we are baptized, and therefore we are saved. Jesus told the man, go wash and you'll see. The man went, he washed, and he saw. And what an incredible testament to the power of God. In John chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus says, I have come in my Father's name. And yet there were still those who did not receive him. In John 6, 38, he says, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And even though the Jews in verses 41 and 42 are grumbling because he indicated that he is the bread that's come down from heaven, they said to him, listen, isn't this just the son of Joseph? We know his mom and dad. How can he say he's come down from heaven? And yet the works that he did displayed without a shadow of a doubt the things that actually were so. In John 8, 42, he says, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. It's no wonder then that in passages like Matthew 28, 18, Jesus will say, all authority, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And the book of Ephesians portrays Jesus as seated in a regal place at the right hand of the throne of God, far above all principalities and powers, above all rulers. There is no ruler who is higher than Jesus the great power, the authority of Christ. And Jesus says he's come to display that power. Returning to John chapter 9, the man goes, he washes, he returns, and he is now a testament to that power of Christ. Verse 8, the neighbors and those who'd seen him before as a beggar were asking, is that not the man who used to sit and beg? Now, apparently, Jesus has sort of left the scene. He's not there anymore. And so this man returns, and he's able to see, and it causes a little com commotion in the community. They're wondering, is that the guy? And some, verse 9, said, it is he. But others said, no, but he's like him. Uh, they say everybody's got a twin, right? I guess this blind man, this for now formerly blind man, had, no, that's not him. It just looks like him. And verse 10 says that they asked him, how were your eyes open? And so he answered, verse 11, this man called Jesus made mud. He, he put it on my eyes. He told me to go and wash in Siloam. I went, washed, and received my sight. And they said to him, well, where is he now? And he said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Verse 14 adds to us, it just happened that it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes, and the Pharisees began to ask him how he received his sight. This begins the first of three waves of interrogation in this text. They're, they're really asking this man, how do you explain the fact that you were blind but now you see? In verse 15, he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and I see. By the way, you get the sense that he's kind of getting tired of answering all these questions? You know, hey, listen, his, his explanation's getting shorter as he goes along. Here's what happened. Mud, I see. Okay? Any questions? That's the way it worked. But in verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. That is referring to Jesus. He can't be from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Oh, come on. Uh, the Jews in that day had grossly misunderstood the Sabbath day mandate of the Old Testament. They took it beyond anything that God ever intended. Jesus would demonstrate that time and again. And so here's Jesus, and he's healed this blind man on the Sabbath day. And instead of rejoicing in the miracle that's right before their eyes, their spiritual blindness causes them instead to focus on their own self-righteousness and to give that as an excuse to deny the reality that is literally before them. How can a man who's a sinner do these kinds of signs, some of them said. And there was a division among them. So verse 17, they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He's a prophet. He's a prophet. You know, a prophet, in terms of the biblical definition, is a man who speaks for God. 
He speaks God's word. Now, oftentimes in Old Testament history especially, and sometimes in the New Testament as well, that, in, that enabled an individual to be able to tell what was going to happen in the future. But, you know, just the fundamental definition of a prophet is someone who speaks for God. Now, we don't have prophets today because the reason why those folks could speak for God is because God had miraculously told them what it is that He wanted them to say. That is, He directly gave them the information that they were to then go out and tell. All right, so this man, the formerly blind man, says, well, here's what I think about Jesus. I think he's a prophet. I think he's a man who speaks God's word. And that reminds us of a second reason why Jesus said he came to earth. Not merely to show God's power, but in the second place, to preach God's word, to preach the truth. In Mark 1, verse 38, Jesus says, I've got to go because I have come for this purpose, to preach and in John chapter 18, when Jesus is on trial, in verse 37, Pilate said, Are you a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. People who are interested in truth will be people who are interested in Jesus. Jesus came to preach truth. But you know, the prophetic aspect of Jesus is maybe doubly true in this sense. Not only did he come to speak God's word, but he came to fulfill God's will. Jesus came to fulfill prophecy. He said, do not think that I came to destroy the law. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. You know, Jesus was able to nail it to his cross, Ephesians 2 and Colossians 2, because in coming he fulfilled the law, took it out of the way, and therefore was able to establish his new law. You know, some have calculated that Jesus fulfilled over 300 of the prophecies that were made in the Old Testament, prophecies that spanned everything from his birth to his teachings to ultimately even his death and beyond those things. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. But then who can forget the graphic portrayal of the crucifixion of Jesus, spoken hundreds of years before the event actually happened in Isaiah 53? Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. All of that portrayed in graphic detail, such that after Jesus had come and lived and died and was buried and was raised, Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, that Christ was buried. And he was raised according to the scriptures. He had fulfilled the prophecy. So in John 7, verses 41 and 42, Jesus says, Others people are saying about him, this is the Christ. And some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? You see, some people were trying to use the Old Testament in a way to disbelieve in Jesus. And sure, Jesus did have some roots in Galilee. And they were saying, isn't he supposed to come from this specific place? And we know from our reading of the account of the birth of Christ that Jesus would actually fulfill those things. 300 prophecies that Jesus had fulfilled. Back to our text in John 9. Who do you think, they asked the formerly blind man, what do you think about this guy? And in verse 17 he says, he is a prophet. Well, verse 18, the Jews didn't believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. This is the second wave of interrogation. All right, we don't believe you. Let's bring in the parents of this man. Bring his parents in here. We want to ask them some questions. So they ask them, verse 19, is this your son who you say was born blind? It's like they're, they're putting them in front of a lineup or something, you know. Please select the man that is your son. Okay, that's him. Uh, was he born blind? Yes, he was. Okay, how then does he now see, they asked at the end of verse 19. And here's what his parents answered, verse 20. We know that this is our son, and we know that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, 
nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's old enough. Let him speak for himself. He's a grown man after all. Let him tell you. He would know better than we would. Now John adds parenthetically that his parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews. Because the Jews had already agreed and it was known among the people that if anybody confessed Jesus as Christ, they were going to be thrown out of the synagogue. We're talking about a societal and even a religious uh, ostracizing of folks if they would uh, confess that Jesus is Christ. So that's why his parents said, ask him, he's of age. So verse 24, round 3, we're going to bring this man back in, the formerly blind man, and they said, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner, referring to Jesus. And he answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. How many times have you sung those words? Amazing grace was blind, but now I see. Here's the guy who wrote them, so to speak. He said it first. He said, listen, here's what I can tell you. I couldn't see, and now I can. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Excuse me, how many times do you need to hear this? Verse 27, he answered and said, I've told you already, and you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? I like this. Now we're getting a little edgy. This is good. Oh, are you asking because you're interested in uh, becoming a disciple of Jesus? Well, that enraged them. Verse 28, they reviled him saying, you're his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. And the formerly blind man replied, why this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said to him, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us. And so they cast him out. Well, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And so Jesus goes to reach out to this man. You know, sometimes we need to get away from some of the worldly influences that would be around us, even those who would be self-imposed religious influences, so that we can actually get closer to Jesus. This man wasn't going to find the way by going through those Pharisees, supposedly the religious elites of the day. Instead, once he was cast out, Jesus comes reaching out to him. He found him, and Jesus begins to ask him questions. Verse 35, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the blind man responded, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you've seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And the formerly blind man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Look at the progression of the formerly blind man and his reaction to Jesus. In verse 11, he calls Jesus a man called Jesus. In verse 17, he says he is a prophet. And then the more the Pharisees challenge him on this, the stronger this formerly blind man's faith becomes. He goes from calling Jesus just a man to a prophet, verse 17. In verse 33, he says he's from God. And in verse 38, he says, Lord, I believe. Wow. The challenging of this man's faith actually strengthened his faith and made it to the point where when Jesus confronted him and asked him point blank, this man responded with belief and with worship. And so Jesus said... And now Jesus reveals what the truth of this account is all about. Verse 39, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Now that's an interesting phrase for at least a couple of reasons. First of all, because we have this thing where Jesus says, I want the people who don't see to see and the people who do see not to see. And then because Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment. If you drop down to John chapter 12, 
beginning at verse 46, there's something interesting Jesus says. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Wait a minute, pause. Jesus, why did you come? Because in John 9, you say, for judgment I came into this world. But in John chapter 12, he says, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Sounds like a contradiction. No, there's not a contradiction in Scripture. There's got to be an explanation. Jesus pronounces a sentencing upon the spiritually blind in John chapter 9. He says, I came for a specific purpose, and that is to show the way. Here's our fourth of five of these that we're going to look at this morning, and that is this. Jesus came to illuminate the path. He came to show the way. In John 9, he said, I'm the light of the world. He said it again in John chapter 8, and he says it again here in John chapter 12. I came into the world as light, verse 46. But here's the thing. Some folks don't like it when you turn the light on. You ever gone to wake up, maybe a, a child for school in the morning, and you go in their room and you turn on the light? How do they react to that? It's not a positive thing, is it? You ever had somebody come in on you when you've been trying to sleep and it's nice and dark and they turn the light? What is going on? Jesus says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They don't want the light to expose their deeds. And so what do they do? They pretend as though they don't see it. They cover up their eyes so that essentially it seems to them that they are still in their own darkness. And Jesus says in John chapter 9, I came... To pronounce that sentencing, that by illuminating the path, he will distinguish those who are walker, but those who walk in the light versus those who walk in the darkness. And in so doing, those who used to be blind, you know, I guess we all started out spiritually blind to begin with, didn't we? We had to come to, as we say, see the light, to be illuminated. But once we see it, we have to make a decision. Will I walk in that light and live in that light? Or will I pretend as though the light's not on? Will I continue in spiritual darkness? That's why in John chapter 9, Jesus says, I came to judge, to pronounce a sentence that those who do not see may see. Those who used to not know, spiritually speaking, now they know and they see and they respond accordingly. But... Those who think they do see, like the Pharisees who were around them, you see, they were unwilling to acknowledge the reality before their very eyes. Here was a man who everybody knew. He was blind and he was a beggar. And suddenly he can see? Well, uh, this guy healed on the Sabbath day. Let's bring that up. What does that have to do with anything, right? We're just looking for excuses. What are they doing? They're putting on their blinders. And they're making truth out of what Jesus said, which was true to begin with, that those who see may become blind. You know, Jesus said that it's going to cost something to follow him. That when we walk in his light and follow his ways, it may be the case that at times that will become a point of contention for some people. That there are those who, because their family members have chosen to follow Jesus that they will be divided with them. In Luke 12, 51, Jesus said, Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? Well, Isaiah 9 says he would be the prince of peace. In fact, the only way we can know the peace of God is through Christ. But in this context, Jesus says, Do you think that I've come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on in one house there may be five divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I'm not going to touch the in-law stuff, okay, for obvious reasons. The point is, here's a family unit, and some have chosen to follow Jesus. And the result of that, even though in following Jesus they've achieved peace with God, 
It has caused division with their fellow man, even their own blood relatives. And because of that, some have chosen darkness while others have chosen light. And there's a division. There's not peace in that sense. Jesus came to illuminate the path. If I can return you back to John 9 and verse 40 as we close this out. Some of the Pharisees heard what Jesus said, and they asked, Are we also blind? And in verse 41, Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt or sin. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. I understand that on the surface that's kind of a head scratcher, but just to make the application for the sake of time, let me explain it this way. If you're blind, you don't have to ask whether you're blind. You know. If you can't see, you know that. They overheard what Jesus said, talking about a judgment against those who think they see, but actually they can't, and how Jesus would really show that and make a distinction between them. And the Pharisees react with a guilty conscience by saying, are you talking about us? Are we blind? And Jesus essentially says, listen, if you were innocently blind, then you would respond to the light, and therefore you would be free from your sin. But because you think you see... You retain your sins. You know, Jesus came to make it where we can get out of the guilt of sin. He paid the price for you and me to make it possible not only for our eyesight to be illuminated, spiritually speaking, but also for our souls to be cleansed. In John 10.10, 10, he says, The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy, but I came that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus came to pay the price. And so here in John chapter 9, we see an individual who was physically blind, who was able to receive physical sight. But at the same time, in the process, his spiritual eyes were opened and it exposed the darkness in which the religious leaders of the day enjoyed, the darkness that they wanted to remain in. The question that comes for you and me is, what will we do with Christ? As we're thinking about why Jesus came, we've heard this morning from his own lips, springboarded out of John chapter 9, that he came to show his power, that he came to preach truth, that he came to fulfill prophecy, that he came to illuminate the path, that he came to pay the price. There's one more thing that I need to tell you about Jesus and what he said about coming. And that is that he will come again. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 3. The question that you and I need to answer this morning is, what will we do with Jesus the biblical emphasis is on the fact, yes, that he came, but also what he came to do. We've described this morning what he came to do. And we've done so by also seeing that it's possible for us to reject his mission and to remain in spiritual darkness. Will you respond to his light? Will you walk in his light? Are you this morning following Christ? If not... Today's the perfect time to begin. Respond to him and follow him for the cleansing that only he can provide. Be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. We're prepared to assist you in baptism this morning if you're prepared to respond. If you need to respond as a Christian, coming back to Christ, stepping once again out of darkness and back into the light, we'd be honored to pray with you and for you. Now's the time to respond if you need while we stand.